Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Aquarium Online Academy. My name is Ty, and I work here at the Aquarium of the Pacific here in Long Beach. And today I'll be leading our exploration as we check out some really amazing animals and talk about some of the ways that these animals might be very different from us, for example, but then some of the things that they have on them that help them to survive out in the ocean. Now, along our program today, we'd encourage you to join us. We're going to actually have uh, my friend Sophie, who's working all of the magic you see here behind me. She's going to throw up this number down here where you can send us a text if you'd like to share any observations or ask any questions along the way. So you can text us at 562-286-1838. Or if you're watching this afterwards, or if it's just easier, you can also send us an email down below there where you see you can uh, email us at live at lbaop.org. Now, like I said, you can use that along our way to share any observations, share anything you notice, and we can answer any questions if you have them live here during our broadcast today. So let's dive in and talk about what we're going to explore today. We're going to learn about um, a very special group of animals. Now, these animals that we're going to talk about today are part of an even bigger group called the invertebrates. Now, if you ever heard that word before, invertebrates, kind of a big word. But what an invertebrate is, it's an animal that doesn't have a backbone. And in many times, in most cases, rather, no bones at all. And so invertebrates are going to be very different from us. Because do, do we have bones in our body? See if you can feel any bones around your body. And chances are, no matter where you try, you're going to find a bone under there. And that's because we have bones all throughout our body. But take a minute to think about what do our bones help us with? Because we have bones, like I said, all throughout our body. What do they help us with every single day? Some of the things we might take for granted that we use our bones for. And if you're with somebody today, if you're watching along with someone, feel free to share your ideas with them as well. What do we as humans use our bones for on a day-to-day -day basis? Could be anything from walking around. We got bones in our legs that help us to move. We have bones in our hands that help us to grab things, to eat our food, to playing our video games, all very important things, right? So we use our bones for a whole bunch of different things every single day, all the time. So what does it mean for an animal that doesn't have any bones? How are they going to accomplish all of these things? Now, like I said, invertebrates are a big, big group of animals that take on all different types of shapes and sizes. And many of them dominate in our oceans. Invertebrates are very common in our oceans. Now, think about something like a fish. Do you think a fish is an invertebrate? Any kind of fish. Hmm. Does a fish have bones? Fish do have bones. So fish are not going to be the animals we're going to explore today because they are vertebrates like us. We have a bone, right? A backbone and many other bones. Invertebrates do not. And so maybe we can start to think about what types of animals live in our oceans that don't have any bones at all. And we're actually kind of hinting at one, as you can see behind us. You probably recognize these animals. These are sea jellies. Now, what you're looking at here are some types of jellies that we have here at our aquarium. These are a type of sea nettle. And we'll talk about those a little bit more later on. So while there are thousands and thousands of different types of invertebrates, we only have a few minutes today. And so what we're going to do is focus in on one group called the Cnidarians. Now I'm going to have my friend Sophie take us over to our document cam so I can write that out for you so you can see what group we're going to be exploring today. Because it may be a new word, a new group. We are going to be talking about the Cnidarians. And that is spelled out like this. So, cnidarians are a couple, include a couple of different animals, including the ones we just looked at today, or a little bit earlier on our webcam. The jellies, the sea jellies, but also include some others that we're going to explore too. Now, I wanted to write this out because, as you can see, it is a word that is spelled um, <coughs> in a pretty interesting way. It has sort of a silent C at the beginning, but this is pr pronounced as the cnidarian. So let's go ahead and see if we can check out a cnidarian. We're going to look at another type of jelly. Those ones we were looking at earlier are a type of sea nettle, but there's another special type of jelly that you can actually touch here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. Now, 
it is not going to be this one. This is another local species, but let's see if we can take a look at that other species first and explore um, this type of jelly that we have, like I said, on our touch lab and in a variety of other exhibits that we have. Now, the type that we're gonna explore first is very common, not only uh, here in California, but they're also found in many, many different parts of the world. These are called the moon jellies. Now, I'm gonna step off to the side for a second, take a close look and see what things do you notice? Because as scientists, and you are a scientist today exploring with me, what scientists do is we make observations. We see what things we notice. That could be anything from the shapes, the colors, the way that they're moving, any structures you see on them, any body parts that look kind of interesting to you, anything like that counts as an observation. So take a few minutes, if you're, or a few seconds rather, and if you're watching with somebody, share your ideas with them. Now we're gonna go ahead and take a look at some moon jellies. We can look at some other pictures, and we could also look at this video again. Now let's take a look. What things stand out to you? Now, one thing that stands out to me about jellies that I think is really interesting is you can almost see through, right through their bodies in many cases. And you can see that these ones do look like a bluish color. Now, that's sort of a trick, though, because the only reason they have that, like, bright blue right now is because the light in their exhibit is shining a blue light on them. Otherwise, moon jellies are completely clear. Now, why might that helpful be helpful out in the ocean to have a completely clear body like this? Hmm. Let's think about that for a second. Why might it be good to have a completely clear body like this? Well, if you think about floating out in the ocean, if you have a completely clear body, you're not, it's going to be hard to see because basically all the light is going to be passing right through you. And so it's going to be very difficult for perhaps something like a predator to find you. Now let's think about what other things we notice on the body of a jelly. Do you notice any interesting shapes on these jellies? Perhaps you notice here they have a big circle on top, and that part is called the bell of a jelly. And then if we look really closely, perhaps we can take a look at another picture where we can see these, they almost look like little hairs kind of hanging off the side. Now those are going to be called the tentacles. Now, the tentacles on a jelly might be really long, or if like on the moon jelly here, they're pretty short and like I said, almost look like little hairs. Now these tentacles serve a very important purpose for sea jellies. What do you know about sea jellies or what have you heard about them before? Because if you've heard of jellies in any way, chances are you've heard that they're animals that sting. And that's true. But stinging is gonna be a very important way for them to survive out in the ocean because that allows them to protect themselves from predators in some cases. But most of the time, it's gonna be helpful for them to catch their own food. Now, jellies like to just drift out in the ocean. As we saw in that video, they kind of just pulse and kind of float around. They're not very fast swimmers at all, but as they drift around in the ocean, they can use those tentacles to catch little bits of food. And in fact, it looks like these ones here might have a little bit of food that they have caught along there, those sort of orange dots there. So those little bits of food can be all sorts of different plankton or tiny animals or very, very young tiny animals. Now that sting allows them to catch that food and then they can use these longer, they, they almost look like they have a similar appearance to the tentacles, but these are called oral arms. Now if you think about our arms, right? We use our arms for a whole bunch of different things oral arms, which almost means like mouth arms, that's what they use to transport the food that they catch on their tentacles up into their stomach, which is going to be up inside the bell here. And so their body is pretty simple. They have the bell where their stomach is going to be inside. They have those tentacles that sting their food and catch it. And then they have their oral arms, which are these more frilly ones that allow them to pull that food down into their or up into their stomach up inside of the bell. Now, there are many different types of jellies that live in basically every part of our ocean. Now, like I said, moon jellies are ones that you can actually touch if you visit us here at the aquarium. And that's because their sting is so weak that humans can actually feel it. And so we don't get hurt by these moon jellies, even if we touch on their tentacles here. But there are other types of jellies that have more, um, have a stronger sting and a very different appearance. 
because they can come in many different sizes and also many different colors as well. Now let's see if we can pull back that picture we were looking at a little bit earlier of another species of jelly that we also find here in Southern California. And this one is one of my personal favorites because I think it is just such a beautiful animal. So we'll see if Sophie can find us this animal right here. Now this one is called the purple stripe jelly. Take a look at this one for just a few seconds and see if you notice any differences. What is different about this one from the moon jelly that we looked at a little bit earlier? Now, since we're sticking with our theme of invertebrates, of course, jellies, all types of jellies, no matter which kind, are not going to have any bones at all, of course. So that's going to be something they share. Do you notice anything else that looks the same between them or anything that is different? Now, one thing that I notice is if we look along these bright pinkish purple tentacles here, those look very different from the ones we saw on the moon jelly. On the moon jelly, they were almost like little hairs that went all the way around. While in this one, you can see that these tentacles are really, really long, and they also have a very beautiful color. And you can see why this animal gets its name that it does, the purple stripe, because it almost looks like it has pinkish purple stripes, not only on its tentacles, but also on the bell as well, on top. Now, does anything look similar between this jelly and the other one we saw before, the moon jelly? Perhaps you're noticing that the they both have these oral arms, those more frilly oral arms that hang down that do the same thing, help them to get their food up into their bell. Now, jellies, like I said, can take on a whole bunch of different sizes. Some might be super tiny and you can barely see them. And there's one type of jelly whose tentacles can get longer than a blue whale. So they come in all different sizes and all different colors too. And that's why I think that they are just some really amazing animals. Now, I want to go ahead and take a look at one more jelly, and that one is called a lagoon jelly. So we'll see if my friend Sophie can find us a picture of a lagoon jelly, and we're going to explore this one next. So take a look at this one next. What do you notice is the same or different from the ones that we saw before? Now, you may notice right away that those colors are quite a bit different. The purple stripe had those beautiful purple stripes, while the moon jelly was almost completely clear. It didn't have any color really at all. What colors do you see on this one here, the lagoon jelly? To me, this one looks almost like it has a sort of golden color down here on its oral arms and even up in its bell too. And it also looks like it has some spots all the way around its bell there. Now you might notice too that those oral arms are a very different shape than those ones we saw before. They were sort of long and flowy in those other jellies, while these ones are kind of short. They only come down just a little bit from the bell, and then it does have its tentacles that also are around its bell as well, but don't look as long as the one on the purple stripe. Now, the lagoon jelly is a very special jelly because it is one of the few types that are not sort of by themselves, we'll say. They actually have an entire other organism that lives inside of their body. Now that golden color that you see is a special type of algae called zooxanthellae. Now zooxanthellae is a tiny organism. You'd have to use a microscope to see what they really look like. But all of those little tiny algae that live inside this jelly help it to give some of its energy because zooxanthellae, those little algae, they use light in order to make energy. And so these lagoon jellies will still catch their food, but they can actually get some bonus energy from the sun, which is a very special way, a very special adaptation that allows them to survive. And so you'll often find these lagoon jellies in very nice, sunny, warm places. Now I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about not any more jellies, but an animal that's sort of like the cousin of the jelly. And that one is called coral. Now let's see if we can explore some coral and we'll hopefully be able to spot some of the similarities that we find between jellies as well as corals. Now perhaps we can start from a picture zoomed out so we can really take a look at what a coral looks like if we were to go diving perhaps out in the ocean. Take a look at this. Does this remind you of anything? Have you seen anything that kind of looks like this one here? Now believe it or not, these things are indeed animals. Corals are animals like jellies are, but they don't really look a whole lot like a jelly now, do they? 
Now this one is a special kind of coral called a brain coral. You can see probably why it gets its name. It looks a whole lot like a brain. Now corals also come in a whole bunch of different sizes and shapes too. Now when we're zoomed out like this, it might be hard to see why did I say that corals and jellies are like cousins to each other? How are they, re how are they somewhat related? These don't look like jellies at all. They're stuck down on a rock. They're not swimming around in the ocean. And I don't see any of those tentacles or any of those things that we just looked at. Well, when we're sitting back like this far or zoomed out from a coral, I agree. It doesn't really look like a jellyfish. But if we take a very close look, if we zoom in on a lot of these corals, and let's see if Sophie can zoom us in on a coral, let's see if we can see why the corals and jellies have a lot in common. So if we're zooming out on corals, we see that they form these beautiful, col colorful coral reefs. They are found in our tropical areas around the globe where it's nice and sunny and warm. And they, these coral reefs are very important for uh, lots of different types of animals. Now, if we zoomed in very, very closely to a young little coral here, do you see anything that looks similar to those jellies we looked at before? Does it look a little bit more familiar now? Maybe a little bit. Now let's think about what things might look the same or similar. Now remember, on our jelly, we know that they have those tentacles that they can use to sting and catch their food. Do you see any tentacles on a coral here? Hmm. Now, although they might not be as long and flowy as the jelly, they do have tentacles here. And so corals share that same ability to use their tentacles to sting. But do you notice any similarities in the colors to any of the jellies we looked at? Now think back to that one we saw right before this, the lagoon jelly. The lagoon jelly sort of had that, that golden color through its body. And you can see that here in this coral too. Now that's because corals, many different kinds of corals, have that same special adaptation that the lagoon jelly did. They have a friend that lives inside their body, that zooxanthellae, that special algae, that gives it that golden color, that sort of golden green color. Now, these zooxanthellae are also giving the coral energy too. And so it's a very special partnership that some of these cnidarians have with that algae. So corals also get a bunch of their uh, energy from the sun. Now let's see if we can take a look at another different type of coral because, like I said, they too come in many different sizes and shapes. So let's see if we can explore a different one and compare the two that we've been able to see so far. We took a look at that brain coral earlier, but let's see if we can take a look at another type. Now this is a very interesting coral. This one is found down in the deep seas. So not going to be found up in the shallow, sunny coral reefs. Now let's see if we can take a look at another one, perhaps, that we can see maybe those tentacles in action. Because before, when we zoomed in on picture, those tentacles were very small. But I think we should have a picture um, that has those tentacles sort of flowing. And we can take a look and see how that shape resembles these, uh, the jellies that we saw and see, talk about what cnidarians have in common. Now take a look at this. Now, this is very up close to another coral, but now you can really start to see that similar shape that corals have to jellies. You can see those tentacles here, right? Now, you probably see many, many different types of tentacles, and that is something that is also different between corals and jellies. Jellies are an individual animal, right? This is just one jelly, one animal. But when it comes to a lot of corals, you actually are looking at a whole bunch and sometimes hundreds or thousands of tiny individual animals that live together and form what we call a colony. Now, corals like this, where you see each individual of these sort of tentacles, and if you look really closely, you can even see their tiny little mouth in the middle there. And so these corals, when they form these giant colonies, they expand, they start really tiny, but they grow to form these huge reefs where hundreds of different corals live together. And so let's maybe take a look and explore because I've also brought us some coral skeletons to check out today. So if we switch over to my camera, I wanna show you some of the different coral skeletons that we have. 
Now I say coral skeletons, but remember, we're not talking about animals with bones, right? Now, although this is, feels pretty tough like a rock, you almost might think, well, is, is this a bone then? No, it's not. But some corals have a special ability to build sort of a tough skeleton on their outside. So for us, we have our bones on the inside. But for corals, some of them make this tough, sturdy skeleton on their outside. So it's not a bone per se, but it does still provide them with a lot of structure and protection. Now, if we take a look here, you can see that each of these little holes in the coral skeleton are where one of those individual corals lived. Each one of those we call a polyp. A polyp is an individual, one of those individuals that together with its friends form one of these large colonies. Now, in this one, it's pretty easy to see where each one will stick out from. And so this kind of coral is similar to the picture we just looked at, actually. But there are also other corals that almost look more like plants in a way. Now, lots of these corals are sometimes referred to as branching corals because they almost look like they're forming branches like a tree. Now, from far away, it can be hard to see where each individual coral lives. And it's not until we take a very close look that we can see each of those little holes where an individual polyp, individual coral polyp, lived. So even though they start from just one tiny little one, they can multiply to the thousands and form these huge, huge structures. And this one I'm holding in my hand is pretty small compared to some of the other ones that can form. But there are even more corals too. There are some that have a more flat shape. This one is called a tongue coral because it almost looks like a tongue, I guess. But these corals, as you can see, sort of grow flat and outwards. Now, are you noticing anything about the colors of these skeletons that we are looking at here? Now, before, when we saw those pictures of those, of those corals kind of um, hanging out on the reef, we saw that oftentimes there's really bright, beautiful colors with them. They can be greens, oranges, Honestly, almost any color you can think of, you might be able to find a coral in that color. But when we're looking at the skeleton, you can see that it's just this solid white color. And that's because after a coral colony dies, those polyps start to break down, and those are what have that color. And so what we're left with after a coral dies is just this white, tough skeleton left behind. Now, corals are very important, though, because they serve many different purposes for not only for themselves, they don't have adaptations that only help them, but they're also helpful for thousands of different types of animals. So out on the coral reefs, those corals, their own bodies build habitat. And so all this habitat built by the corals means that there's lots of places to hide for certain animals. It also means that there might be lots of food for different animals. And there's even some animals that eat the coral directly, like the parrotfish. And so all these different animals um, found on these coral reefs mean that corals are super important. They are a living animal, but they are building the habitat for thousands of other animals that call the coral reef home. So there's also one other kind of cnidarian that I want to talk about briefly. And one of them you can find on the coral reef too that also lives with some friends. Now, before we've been talking about animals that, um, cnidarians that have that zooxanthellae that live inside of their body, but there's another special type of cnidarian that you find in also many different parts of the world, including the coral reef, and some that look like this. So this is called a sea anemone. Now take a close look down here at the sea anemone. Do you see anything that looks similar to the jellies or the corals that we've been looking at down here? Does anything look familiar? Now this one's probably a bit easier to see. These have tentacles too. And so you can see that all these cnidarians, the main thing they have in common are these tentacles that allow them to sting to catch their food and provide safety. But you may be wondering, well, these tentacles, they sting to catch their food. Is this sea anemone catching a meal right here? The answer is no, it's not. And that's because some anemones have formed partnerships with some special types of fish, including one that might be pretty familiar with everyone if you've seen a certain movie, and that's the clownfish. So let's see if we can take a look at a clownfish in an anemone, because this partnership that these animals have formed are beneficial for both. 
So what the anemone gets is the anemone gets some food scraps. If the uh, fish brings back some food, it might be able to snack on some of those leftovers. And the anemone, or the clownfish, gets protection from the anemone because those tentacles that it has allows them to ward off any other predators that might want to come here. So it's a win-win relationship between the sea anemone and the clownfish. Now, clownfish are also found on coral reefs, and so some anemones, like the ones you see that form that partnership, are home to, um, or are found on the coral reefs, right? But anemones are also found in many different parts of the world, including here in Southern California. So let's see if my friend Sophie can pull up another picture of a sea anemone of one that lives perhaps closer to us here at home. Now this is a great picture of one of our, or a great video of one of our sea anemones that we have here in our touch lab at the aquarium. So if I step off to the side for just a minute, take one more round of observations and see what you notice about this sea anemone. Do you see anything in common with those other animals that we've explored? Do you see any differences? Are the colors the same? Is there anything that looks interesting to you? Now this anemone is called a fish eating anemone. They get that name because sometimes they like to eat fish. But this large anemone you can find here in California, as long as many other regions um, in the Pacific Northwest. But this fish eating anemone here is pretty big and you can see that it's one individual animal. So remember, when we were thinking about some of those corals, there was thousands of tiny little polyps. You can think of anemones as just one large polyp, one animal. And so these, they also have those tentacles, as you can see, just like the jellies, just like the corals. But right in the middle there that we did look at on a coral earlier, you will be able to see their mouth. So the way that these anemones are eating is as they catch things along their tentacles here, they can pull it right into its mouth, which is that structure right there in the middle. Now, anemones are pretty tough animals. Sometimes you can find them living in the intertidal. The intertidal is where the land meets the ocean, where the waves are crashing, where the sun is warm. And so some anemones have made their home there like these anemones here. And so they're also found in many different parts of the ocean. And while, not, and while these ones don't have a clownfish friend for them, they've also made, um, a, they've made their, found their way to survive out in the intertidal by using those no bones to their benefit. Because as the water will flow back and forth and the waves crash, having no bones means that they can just flow with the waves. It doesn't really harm them. In the same way that jellies earlier use their no bones to kind of drift out in the ocean. So let's quickly recap some of, those, some of these animals that we explored today. We took a look at the cnidarians, which is a special group of invertebrates. So remember, invertebrates are animals with no bones. And while there's so many, we can only talk about a couple during our program today. So today we explore the cnidarians, which includes the sea jellies. And we talked about their structure, how they have that bell on top. They have those tentacles that they hang down from here, like on this flower hat jelly. And then we talked about those oral arms that hang down in the middle, those more frilly ones that help them to bring their food in. And then we compared these jellies to their cousins, the corals, which are much, sometimes look very similar by having those same tentacles and a little mouth in the middle, but they form huge reefs and they work together by having hundreds of or thousands of individual animals working together. And then finally, we talked about another cnidarian, the sea anemone, which you can find in many different parts of the ocean, including like this in our um, intertidal or tide pool habitats. And they've also made their life surviving using those tentacles to catch their food, sticking down onto a rock, and then surviving out in the tide pool or in other parts of our oceans. So I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you had fun. Hopefully you learned something new about this amazing group of animals, and I encourage you to keep on exploring because there is still much more to know about the amazing group of animals than Idarians. And so keep asking questions, stay curious, and we'll see you next time. Have a great day.